1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll be reading verses 18 to 25. Let's listen to God's words to us. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure But if when you do good and suffer for it you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. Now, delay, delay, that word, it can be kind of one of the worst words in the English language, can it? Um, Your train is delayed. Your parcel has been delayed. Although sometimes it's a little more serious, isn't it? Your hospital appointment has been delayed. And life, life is full of, full of them, full of these, these gaps, these moments of time between an action and the fulfillment of that action, or between you know, someone doing something and there being a consequence to what they've done. I, all, I order a book, and there's a delay. I have to wait for it to arrive. And actually, delays, they've been built into the world right from the beginning. Uh, like there's the, the de- delay of maturing, isn't there? God made living things grow. There's a, there's a gap from the beginning of life to its fruition. Apples, they don't appear immediately on trees. Wheat doesn't immediately ripen. A child isn't immediately born. There's this natural delay. But then, when we uh, had the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, a different kind of delay appeared. A new kind of time appeared. At a moment when what has happened Uh, And then uh, what should happen? There's there's a moment between them. So for Adam and Eve, there was a delay. A delay between their sin and their punishment. They should die, but it didn't happen immediately. A gap, a pause. God held off for some reason. He allowed delay. This opened up into the world what I'm going to call the great delay. God now, he has a world filled with sin and shame. A world broken and rebellious. And yet even from the beginning, he he promised something about it. Evil destroyed under the, the heel of the snake crusher. But he did not come straight away. A great delay between the fall and justice. And sin entering the world, it's meant that we face lots of new kinds of delays, not just natural ones. I think there are two kind of major kinds. One is a delay that we have absolutely no power over whether from people or just life circumstances, you know, like that delay between being ill and getting well again. We know illness should not happen, and yet here it is. And we go to the hospital, and the doctors give us medicine, but then we just have to wait. Or that delay when someone more, more powerful does something against us, perhaps our boss or a parent, they, they hurt us, they slander us, then nothing seems to happen about it. There's no justice, no consequence. It just sits there like a perpetual shadow over us. Here in 1 Peter that we've just read, we hear Peter talking to servants who are facing unjust masters, perhaps beating them or blaming them or or not feeding them properly. We don't know. But for those servants, they're in a, a moment of time where life doesn't match up, 
What should have happened, justice on those masters hasn't happened yet. Then there's a second group of those moments in life that we do have power over. And yet still there are delays. Like as parents, we're seeing our children, I don't know, time and time again, perhaps disobey or get something wrong and we just try and do something about it and yet growth seems so slow. Or, or in our own lives, we long to be better at something. We ro- long to get rid of a sin or whatever it may be. And this delay, it's so frustrating. So we're living. We're living in the midst of the great delay. And life throws at us time and time again these smaller delays. And we struggle. We struggle in these moments. We struggle to know what to do, how to live, how to respond, how to wait. And the thing is, God has instructed us. He's told us. He's even shown us how to live. And it's with patience. Patience. Now we'll come on to what this looks like in a moment, but we often know what it doesn't look like, don't we? Our quick annoyance with the situation. You know, the rising rising heat inside of us. The way we, we lash out with a sharp tongue at anyone nearby or go kind of stone cold silent in a huff. Delays, they, they somehow bring out the worst in us. We hate that moment of time. It's like it offends us and all we do is kind of pour fire onto it and make it worse. Now there might be some righteous anger thrown in but it often gets shrouded and lost in the sin that bursts out. And we know there's a better way, don't we? A more God-like way. A way that breathes life into a moment rather than increasing the hurt. And that's patience. And to learn patience, we need to get a a new view of these delays in our life. We need to start by getting God's perspective on it all. See how he sees it. And then as we do, we pray Christ will begin to to grow that fruit of patience in our hearts. Life-giving patience. So let's look at 1 Peter 2. And let this example of Christ's patience point us below the service. Because we want to think, well, what did Jesus know about God's view of it, of it all? What did he, he know God saw? Well, firstly, he knew God sees justice. He knew God sees justice, the end, the end of this great delay. Justice, the end of the great delay. So here in 1 Peter 2, Peter's encouraging these household servants to live righteous lives, to live obediently even when they're under pressure, to keep going as God wants them to with these unjust masters. And to encourage them, he turns their eyes to Jesus as he walked towards the cross. And he, Jesus was always the, the epitome of steadfast obedience, always doing what was right, patient. And as he shows us Jesus, it's as if Peter kind of takes out a pair of glasses, a pair of glasses to put on our eyes so that we see things more clearly. And the glasses are God's view of the world. Just look at verse 23. So when he, that is Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself, and here are the glasses, to him who judges justly. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Christ viewed the delay differently to us because he saw God's view. And God not only had the view of on, uh, his eyes on the small things of life, but also on the big. Because God sees the end of the great delay. That delay which we've said began in Genesis 3. Sin entering the world. Sin and pain. Injustice and death. He saw all that plagued his world, but he knew its end. Everything would be put right. Everything brought to the light. In a word, justice. God judges justly. That's what Christ knew. Nothing skips his notice. Nothing will pass him by. God will bring an end to the great delay. Now, as we dig into patience, I think it's helpful to have in our minds how God defines his own name back in Exodus 34. Just listen to this. Exodus 34, this is the Lord speaking. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Did you hear that ending? Who will by no means clear the guilty? 
justice. God will hold all sin to account. Vengeance is his. Evil will be shown for its lies. Crushed once and for all. He will do it. He will do it rightly. I think many of the delays in our world that we struggle with are actually delays of justice. You know, when someone sins against us, we can be in that position of power and we can do something about it. You know, they're our colleague or subordinate, they're our child or younger sibling, and we want justice. They've gone against us and we want them to feel the consequence of what they've done and feel it now. No delay, no gap, justice. And yet God says, no, justice is mine to bring and I, it will come. The delay will end and I will do it rightly and truly. Because often the justice we try to bring, it's overbearing, out of proportion, a tongue lashing, too vigorous, a cold shoulder, too drawn out. But not God. He will bring justice perfectly. The delay will end and end rightly. But on the other hand, we can be sinned against when we have no power like the servants Peter was talking to, like in I don't know, the face of an angry parent or abusive husband or unfair boss, and we can't do anything about it. It can be crushing, to say the least. And time might seem to hold still. There's no retribution. There's no justice. And we, we know trying to take things into our own hands might make it worse, and it feels hopeless. Well, may we see God's view of it all. He will judge justly. Death is not a barrier to justice. In eternity, nothing will be forgotten. He will by no means clear the guilty. It will be the end of the great delay. But the end is not just an end filled with punishment, is it? Justice, it's a wonderful word. It is much bigger than that. It's also the righteous, the good. God's going to vindicate it. It's going to be shown for what it is. The innocent cleared. The slandered shown to be pure. What was lost, restored. What was taken will be given back. Christ exalted. As verse 24 suggests, there's going to be healing. By his wounds you have been healed. It says, the sheep will be on the right path. There will be life and restoration. So there is an end. Suffering will not go on forever. Pain will not have the final word. Even as our tears might feel endless today, they will be wiped away then. You know, as we watch the news and see of more disasters, more wars, more problems, more families separated by death, we can, we can be struck by hopelessness, can't we? It's as if even with all the progress, even with all the new technology, with advances in medical science, even with all of that, we're just going round and round in circles, an endless dance of joy and disaster. But that's not the true view of the world. Yes, we experience both now, but there's hope. There's a day God sees that Jesus knew. It's justice, the end of the delay, it's coming. Now that, that may be true, but that opens up a whole world of questions perhaps for you, doesn't it? Especially about the present because does that mean God's just kind of having a little game with us? He's just set the world in play and let it run. Let it burn until the day he finally acts. Has he just kind of put his feet up? Well, Jesus didn't just trust God's ending. He was also trusting God's present. He knew God's view of the present. And instead of justice, it's grace. Justice, that's the end of the great delay. Well, grace, it's the use of of the great delay. Just listen again to verses 24 and 25. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This, this great delay is actually the time of salvation. That delay has opened up a space for grace it's given a moment in time for Jesus to come. The Son of God, he took on flesh. He walked as a man on the dusty streets of Nazareth. And then in fullness of time, he was nailed to the cross, bearing our sins in his body, facing the wrath of God, dying in our sin that we might not have to. Why? So there might be healing. By his wounds you have been healed. So there might be repentance and restoration for you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. God delayed his justice so that we might be saved. 
so that he might show the extent of his grace and compassion. What's the Lord's name again? The Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We only know God because he delighted, because he was patient, because he didn't mete out justice straight away. Slow to anger. What wonderful words to our ears. You know, just today, there are people in this world, perhaps right now in a church somewhere, turning to Jesus Christ as their Savior, finding eternal life in him, knowing the grace of God, the goodness of God in a way like never before. All because he delayed. All because he was patient. That's what his patience is. He's given space for his grace and compassion. God is showing us something profound about the way he works. Delays, they're not just a dull time to him. They're not empty space. They are moments that he fills with his grace. He is a God at work, a God building his kingdom, saving sinners, glorifying his son. He's a bit like the, the perfect craftsman. You know, often when you look at someone and you know, work as a painter or, or someone working with nature, we kind of we feel like we look on and we don't see much going on. But in fact, I don't know, they're, they're allowing a color to become just, just right or allowing the, the weather to have an impact in just that right way. There's an unhurried beauty to their work. There's method in, in, in what looks like madness and that's the work of God. In each delay, both in the big and in the small, God is reaching into time and using it. He's using it to save. He's using it to sanctify. He's at work beautifying his people, making us more and more fit to be the bride of his son. It's grace, grace, the use of the great delay. And somehow, as we see this bigger picture, what God is up to, life for us can take a different shape a shape that isn't rushed, but is modeled on Christ and his patience. So we've got justice, the end of the great delay. Grace, the use of the great delay. Well then, patience is embracing the delay. Patience is embracing the delay. Let's turn and look at Jesus himself. Because what we see in Jesus is someone who imitates God's patience by embracing that patience. And Jesus, he shows us two sides to the one coin of patience, of embracing this delay. First, we, we see it's enduring wrong obediently. And then second, we'll see it's creating time for grace. So Jesus, first of all, he endured wrong obediently. Jesus walked an extraordinary path of suffering unjustly. Just think back, he was reviled, mocked, beaten, taunted, whipped, nails driven into his hands and feet, a crown of thorns tearing into his scalp. And yet in the midst of it all, we see his patience. He bore the injustice. He put up with it. His anger was slow to come. Now Peter here in uh, in this passage, he doesn't talk about the fact that Jesus could have just ended it all in his divine justice. Notice he doesn't say, when he was reviled, he did not call down the angels from heaven. Or when he suffered, he did not reveal the almighty wrath of the creator. Now those things were true, but that's not Peter's point here. Instead, Peter's pointing to the fact that Jesus was patient in his humanity as a man in circumstances where he was the weak one the powerless one, the one under the abuse of the Roman Empire, a small, insignificant prisoner before the powers that be. And in this moment, Jesus remained silent. As Peter says, he did not revile in return. He did not threaten. He walked that path to the cross. He endured without doing any wrong in return. Middle of verse 20. If when you do good and suffer for it, you endure... This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. That's Jesus, isn't it? He didn't lose his cool. He didn't shout and rant. He didn't throw a few punches and get a cheap shot. Think of Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, cutting off, a, uh, off the priest's servant's ears. 
Jesus was not like that. He was calm, he was dignified. Why verse 23? Because he continued to entrust himself to the one, to him who judges justly. For Jesus in this moment, the fixed reality of that future judgment day allowed him to keep walking, to endure, to not exact justice in his time, but in God's time. That's patience. It's enduring the wrong again and again and again without sinning in return. And for some of us, you know that fight. You have been powerless against people around you, perhaps at work under an abusive boss, and you just wanted to lash out, you wanted to shout the house down, get your own back, even in some small way, just a tiny bit of justice and revenge. And yet, in this dark walk, in this delay, God is saying, trust me, justice will come, I will do it rightly and fully, entrust yourself to me, endure. Patience in the face of things we have no power over, it's endurance, it's holding on to doing good, and even when it's the last thing we want, it's doing good even when all is going on around you. That's important to say, not reviling, not threatening an oppressor, does not mean it's then wrong to, to call the police on someone. It's not wrong to see the law intervene for the safety of you, your family. Peter here, he's talking to slaves with no power over their master. They're owned by them. He's talking about Jesus as a Roman prisoner walking to the cross. They couldn't do that. But from elsewhere, we know God has given us the state. He's given us the law as a way of exacting some justice on this earth before he comes. But that is the state. It is measured. So after the testimony of witnesses, it's done justly and rightly. Now you might decide to overlook something, but Christ's walk of suffering doesn't mean you, you have to stay in dangerous situations. I know this has been used by manipulating abusive partners. You, know, you need to turn the other cheek, they say. But no, God has given means for justice in this world, and obedience can often mean using it. But it does not mean, it does not mean us taking some swift revenge to try and get equal as we lash out. It does not mean sin. For Jesus, he had to entrust himself to the end of the great delay, judgment day itself. He embraced the delay. He endured wrong obediently. And this endurance, seen as we've face other kinds of hard and painful circumstances as well. I think it, it kind of links into ill health. As the problems keep going, as the next hospital appointment comes and goes, the next blood test, surgery, injection, we don't just entrust ourselves to God and his judgment, but also God and his salvation in the future. We wait. And rather than reviling others, I think the temptation might be against God himself. Like Job's wife, we're, we're tempted to curse God and die. But Job's patience, he went towards God. Yes, he questioned and called on God, but he waited, he endured, he, he waited for God to act and to answer. Waiting because he knew his Redeemer lived. The resurrection was to come. And so he endured, in a sense, the wrong of that illness obediently. So that's the first way we embrace the delay. We endure wrong obediently. But that leaves us the question, what does it mean uh, to then embrace the delay when we can do something about it? Well, it's... It's about creating time for grace. With Jesus, we do know he had the power to reverse the walk to the cross. He's God's son, equal with the Father in glory and power. Why, why did he keep walking that path? Why was he patient against this kind of cosmic sin? Why? Because Jesus knew God had purposes in this moment. He knew there was grace to be shown. Here was a man who, who sought the good of those around him. He was patient. Patience for him was also creating this time for grace. You know, we know from other accounts, he even moved towards those who killed him, calling for God to forgive them. But this walk was also towards us. He was walking to the cross to save sinners. Jesus Christ, he saw the bigger framework, the use of the delay, grace. He realized there was a moment for something else to happen. If, if justice was to come later, then grace could come now. His patience gave space 
for the other fruit of the Spirit to blossom. His patience, it gave a moment just for those soldiers to experience peace from someone. Perhaps they'd never seen that before in their lives. They'd only taken heat from prisoner after prisoner, cursing, abusing, shouting, threatening at them. Just imagine what it was like for them. Surely it would harden your heart to the horrors you're about to perform. But they didn't get that from Jesus. From him they experienced peace and gentleness. Just as he had done with the great delay, so he did with this small moment as he walked outside the city of Jerusalem. When you or I act in patience with someone, we're emulating God. In fact, as we're patient, what we're doing, we're creating this this God-like moment of time, this space in yours and my life for God to bring grace. You know, as we're slow to anger, rather than bringing someone to immediate justice, suddenly there's a place for a gentle word. A place for a kind instruction, a peaceful moment for repentance and reflection. And as we sinned against, as we suffer and wait rightly before God, so we give space for God to use that moment. To use it in us. You know, to grow the fruit in our own lives, perhaps our love for the person in front of us. Perhaps to grow our capacity for for more forgiveness. To experience how gracious God has been with them to increase my trust in his purposes. But God also uses that moment, that patience, in others. You know, it often stops someone going on the defensive, doesn't it? It disarms them. And it may just help them to say sorry. It's not guaranteed. They might harden their own heart. and We leave it to God. That's between them and God to deal with. And as I've said before, this doesn't mean there's no justice in our world today. God has given people with authority. The state still has to exact justice. Elders in the church, parents in the family. So there's still a place for discipline, still a place for punishment. But doesn't this just kind of rip up and deeply challenge our quick tempers and impatient hearts? I wonder if it's in our closest relationships that we're less guarded with our impatience. I don't know, whether it's to our flatmate who we see every day and still hasn't done the dishes, or our parent who we think is interfering again in something that's got nothing to do with them, or a child who for the 16th time doesn't do what we've asked them not to do. I'm amazed how strong the desire is when someone wrongs me, how strongly I want to get them back. I want them to suffer as I have. If they've made me wait, I'm going to make them wait. If they said something mean, I'm going to give as good as I got. And yet, to embrace God's delay, his delay that brings grace means emulating it. It means creating that time, that time for a thoughtful word, not a sharp one we regret. It gives time for moving towards someone rather than retreating and giving them the cold shoulder. Patience. Patience, it creates that grace-filled delay. It's a wonderful thing. As God promises to bring justice on the final day, as he promises to bring grace in the meantime, may we, may we be people who embrace the delay. Let it give space for Christ to be at work in us and those around us. Enduring the wrong, creating the time, and all for God's glory. Amen.